So then, dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We love our country. I think it's very obvious that whenever you, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's Independence Day or the dead middle of winter, we see people with American flags. I remember when I was a foreign exchange student in Germany, I, I never saw a German flag. I, I very rarely saw anyone with, with any sort of emblem or symbol of the, of the German flag. And when I came back to America, you, you couldn't miss it. We love our nation. We have so many people who have proudly served our nation in various ways, especially we have noticed them serve in our military. But look at our nation right now. What is there to be said about a nation that's at war with itself? While no civil war has officially been declared, we as Americans are facing some very dire times in our country. Continually reports of hatred, violence, disaster. The frustrating news that our politicians are constantly at each, other, at each other's throats. And then the other problem is that even our news reports are conflicting. We don't know where to go for, for trust or truth. You know, we're a nation that a part of our founding philosophy and principle is religious freedom. But yet there are people out there who worship in fear that because of the attacks that have happened on houses of worship. Injustices are rampant in our country. Many people fear to live in peace. The history of our nation, we're, we're really no different than any other nation. We have many times of, of great things, many times of really terrible things. We have things that make America great, and then things that make us hang our heads in shame. In World War II, we were known for being those who defend the lives of the innocent. But yet, in our expansion west, the history shows that we trivialized the lives and the land of the native people. Our nation is filled with unparalleled beauty. But yet, for the sake of profit, we have seen people get rid of that beauty. The reality is this, that wherever there is good, there is evil as well. And that's our problem. You might have been a little bit confused as we are celebrating our, our, our observing Independence Day that you see the title for this worship service and the title for this sermon is Our Problem. But it's important that we reflect on this problem, this problem of evil. Because the problem of evil is rampant and it's everywhere. And as we look to Scripture, you open up the first page. Well, and you turn one more page, and you find that the problem of evil is right there. As the first man and the first woman are, are tempted and led away from God. One of the biggest problems of evil is lies. Did God really say? Twisting that truth so that people rebel. And this evil has, has continued and continued and continued. Many of you are probably very familiar, either have said it yourself or heard somebody say it. Why do bad things happen to good people? And the simple answer is evil. But if we're honest with ourselves, evil is not, is not an outside, not just an outside presence, but is also an internal problem for all of us. That's why Paul's letter to the Romans, especially chapter 7, is one of the most profound pieces of Scripture. I think every single one of us can ident identify easily with this. The good that I want to do, I don't. The evil that I want to avoid, I do. At the root of this problem is sin. It's a deep an internal corruption that goes way, way further than just the bad stuff that we do. Because it even corrupts good things. 
as Paul puts it so well, the good I want to do, I don't. It's, and it's as simple as that. But it doesn't matter that it's a, a simple answer to this problem. The problem is, is that it's impossible for us to solve this problem. We, we look at our, ourselves and our good works and think, well, I can, I can do good. I can avoid sin. And so we take a step forward to do a good work, something loving for our neighbor, something loving for a stranger, uh, an act of praise to our God, a prayer of thanksgiving. We take that step, but then immediately fall back in the wrong direction because the thoughts that we, for some reason, can't control immediately turn to hatred or greed. As Paul so well describes it in Romans 7 today, there is a war within our own bodies, a fight that is happening, a fight that is fighting for our our very hearts and minds to control us, fighting to force us to rebel. Paul, at the end of this uh, reading, has this cry of anger and frustration that so many of us can feel. What a wretched person I am. I'm trying to do all these right things, but I constantly fall into the wrong things. I know that I'm not supposed to do that, but I can't stop myself for some reason. I am a wretched person, so who's who's going to save me? Because I can't save myself. And the answer is that only God can save. And only God will. In the presence of evil, we see God's solution. And what's very important to notice is that solution is there at the beginning. The promised blessing of the mother's womb, of a child who will be born, of a man who will grow, who will crush the head of evil. And although evil will strike its heel, Evil's head will be crushed. The only way to handle evil and sin is to utterly and completely destroy it, to wipe it out at its core. But that terrifies us because that would mean that we would need to be wiped out and destroyed. But destroying a sinner does not destroy sin. So God's solution to sin and evil is found in Jesus. Watch how Jesus addresses the problem of evil in his ministry. He sees the corruption of disease and heals it. The corruption of lies and false teachings, and he teaches the truth. The corruption of the body. I always, I I will never not love the the, um, story of Jesus healing the blind man. Can you imagine blind from birth, and then he can see that evil is healed by Christ. But those are just surface problems. The core of sin can only be paid in death. As Paul also says elsewhere in Romans, the wages of sin is death. But that bill of sin that we all had was paid for by Christ as he dies in our place. He pays this price with his life. But I constantly want to remind you why we have these big symbols everywhere, these crosses. Because for us, this is no longer a symbol of death, but a symbol of life, a symbol of forgiveness. Jesus' tomb is not a shameful grave to look into, but a, a place where we see victory. Because Christ is not in his tomb. He is not dead and buried. He is alive. He is risen. Showing that his payment for sin and death has been accepted. And so to answer Paul's question, who will save us from this body of death? He immediately answers, Jesus. Jesus Christ our Lord will save us. But it's not the end of it all, is it? We are called to be God's presence in this world. We are not freed so that we can just go and do whatever we want, knowing that, well, my sin's forgiven. I just have to go to church and say, hey, Jesus, forgive me, and then it's forgiven. We know it doesn't work like that. We know that we have been given this this great gift of grace and forgiveness so that we can live as God's people. 
God's people who have been freed from this sin and this evil to be God's presence in this world. This is a powerful picture, and you're all very aware of all the protests that have been happening. This man, this white man was hurt in a protest, and he was, uh, I guess, what, a, what do they call him, anti-protesting? The black people were protesting, saying black lives matter, and this white man was protesting, saying the opposite, and he got hurt, and the black, these black men brought him to safety. That is what it means to be the presence of God. That you overlook things and you love and you serve, regardless. That white man probably hated that man, probably to his face hated him. But that didn't matter. This is a powerful image because it reminds us what we are called to do, how we are called to help and carry and love and serve, regardless of the person, even a person who might hate us. But you know, as I talk about how we need to be God's presence in this world, for so long I, I always thought that that meant we need to be missionaries, right? We need to travel overseas and go and spread the word of God. I always thought it meant somewhere else. But as I continue to work in Faribault, we need it desperately here. Many of you know very well that I love going to the Signature, that I like sitting and, and writing my sermons there. It's a nice, quiet atmosphere. Food's good too, so that doesn't hurt. But I was working on this message and I overheard a woman say this comment regarding these protests, that those people should be just shot. If it would happen here, I wouldn't hesitate to grab my shotgun, load it up, and fire it into someone's chest. That's the hatred that's present in our town. But what about other evils? At the signature, I see people doing those pull tabs some of them looking like they're throwing down their very last cent. That's another evil. Constantly we hear people talking about what they're seeing on the TV, on the news, and it's, they're never pleasant comments. It's, it's typically hateful things. You know, I always get a little bit frustrated and angry when I hear people talk about America as a Christian nation. Because more often than not, what I hear them saying is that we expect legislation and laws and rules and all these things to pass in a secular government to force people to follow a Christian way of life. What should it really mean for America to be a Christian nation? Because why would people want to follow a Christian way of life when we hear Christians say and do evil things? And so if we want this to be a Christian nation, that's on us to make it happen. And in order to make that happen, that means that we have to love and serve in radical ways to get over our prejudices and our, and our personal sins and, and the hatred that might be in our hearts to overlook things in people's lives, to love them and to serve them. Because I will always want to remind you that this is what you have been freed to do. But this is also how God has loved you. He overlooked all of your sins and freed you. He overlooked all these problems that you have in your heart, the evil that is waging war in there, and he freed you. God has blessed us to be his presence. You are not blessed to expect others to do it. You are blessed to do it. And these words of Matthew's gospel are very helpful today as we Think about, well, how can I do this? What does this look like? And in Matthew, Jesus' truth comes and says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for, and, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. People in this country are burdened. People in this town are burdened. We have seen how people are burdened with hatred. How they seem to have no love in their heart. But let's not forget about those who are burdened by their finances. Who, who can barely make ends meet. Who can barely pay rent. What about those who are burdened in our country with no time or energy because they have, to, they have to do all of these things. They have to work all of these jobs. They have to go to all of these events. They can take no time to rest. What about those who are burdened from a lack of purpose? Who wander from thing to thing to thing seeking truth, seeking fulfillment? All of these burdens can be removed by Christ Jesus. He says, take off that yoke that you have on you and put on mine. Mine's light, mine's easy. Christ made this available to everyone so that they would be released. As Nancy said it very well, this country is founded on freedom. And this is what God offers. And I know that I, I say some challenging things. Some of these things I even hesitate to say because I know people are so passionate about this nation. But I want you to take that passion that you have for this nation. To stop and see how beautiful our town is. I live on prairie and drive down and there's these beautiful old trees that are overhanging the road. It's gorgeous. And Minnesota is a beautiful state. I'll be honest, I prefer the, the northern parts up there a little bit more than, than down here, seeing some mountains and, and, and things like that. That doesn't mean that it isn't gorgeous around here, especially things like Cannon Lake. I love kayaking on the straight river. God has blessed us with beauty all over. And this is a beautiful country. For vacation, I'm excited to go and, and see Yellowstone uh, coming up here in a couple of weeks. I'm so excited. And honestly, I'm just excited because I get to see the beautiful mountains in that national park. But it's not just our country, right? We have a beautiful world. It's just been blessed in every corner by, by God's artistic touch, given such beauty but let us always remember that, that this is not our end goal. That while we may love our, our, our town, our state, country, our world, this is not our end goal. Verse 12 of our, our reading from Zechariah, we are prisoners of hope. We are these people who are constantly looking forward, hoping in the future that God has promised for us controlled and contained by that hope. We are we're prisoners of it, as, as, as he says. Because our focus is on this end promise and this end image that Zechariah has given to us. Peace brought to nations, an end of war, instruments of war broken and shattered, God's rule from sea to sea, prisoners set free. And that freedom and that hope those are part of the presence that you get to be in this country. That you get to declare freedom to those who are held captive by their sins. Amen? Amen. Amen.